Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm happy you're joining us today. My guest today is William Tingle, and we've been trying to get this podcast done for a while. William is the host of Sub2Deals.com and the Sub2Deals Show podcast. He's a nationally known real estate investor, investing coach, author, and public speaker. But like a lot of us, in 1999, he ordered a Carlton Sheets Nothing Down course off of late night TV. I did the same thing. He read it and he took a $5,000 advance from a credit card to start his real estate investing career. So that's how he got started. William has been investing for over 20 years. He's wholesaled and rehabbed numerous properties, but he found his real niche in what he calls sub two, which is buying subject to the existing financing. In his 20 plus years of real estate investing, he sub would over 500 properties. William has also trained and coached thousands of students across the country to become financially successful real estate investors. So welcome to the show, William. Well, thanks, Sharon. I appreciate it so much. So glad to be here with you today. I'm glad we finally got it done. Now, I just hit kind of the highlights of your big investing career and what came before. So how about you fill in the gaps and tell everybody what you were doing before real estate and uh, dive a little deeper into what you've been doing. Well, Sharon, I was like most people. I had a job. I had a pretty good job, actually. Uh, I was, I'd been in the restaurant industry for about 20 years. I started as a dishwasher in a pizza hut and just worked my way up. Uh, in 1999, I was a director of operations for a fast food uh, chain in Georgia and managed several units, was driving hundreds of miles every week from store to store and that sort of thing. I was, I was really just tired of working 60, 70 hours a week. I didn't have any time with my family. And I was just really just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And um, I was looking for something different. One, I had no idea what it was going to be. Uh, didn't graduate high school, quit school in the ninth grade. So I didn't have a degree to fall back on. Uh, they have you in the golden handcuffs. You're living in Georgia, so the cost of living is pretty low, you know, and you're making $60,000, $70,000 a year, which is pretty good money for a ninth grade graduate. And uh, so I'm like, what am I going to do? And I, you know, I had a manager quit in one of our stores. And so I had to drive up to take over the place. And I was just up late that night in a hotel room and saw Carl Carlton Sheets infomercial. I'd seen it a thousand times, you know. If you ever notice, if you have kids, they make commercials for kids with some kind of hypnotic thing. Kids can be running and playing and they can run through the living room and that commercial is on and they just stop dead in their tracks and just watch the commercial. And the Carlton Sheets commercial was always like that for me. I'd watched it a bunch. But that night I just said, you know what, why not give it a try? So I ordered it from that hotel room, got it a couple of weeks later in the mail and just started doing what he said. And, you know, a month later I bought a house and then the next month I bought another house. And I said, gee, this works. So many people got started with Carlton Sheets. Wasn't it a green binder? As I recall, it was a big old binder and um, I kept that thing for so long. I think I finally got rid of that maybe three or four years ago. I just couldn't bear to throw it away because it's like a, it's like a pivotal moment in your life. But like you said, I had seen the commercial so many times and on one particular night, yeah, I whipped out my credit card and bought that course, but it opens up the possibility of creative finance. Right. So that's what it does. That's what it did for me. Carlton, now, Carlton, Carlton Sheets is a great beginner course because even though it's very, it's very shallow, it covers just about every type of creative finance. It's very ethical. He doesn't teach you to do anything shady. Uh, and you can get them for like 10 bucks on eBay now. So if anybody wants to get started, you know, inexpensively, I can run out and grab one. I, I agree because when you give someone a full-blown course on like something like creative finance, it's too much. It's right. too much. So I think it's a great introductory course. And like a lot of people, you chose something that spoke to you out of there and somebody else may, may, may choose something different. So you going back a little bit, you did wholesales and rehabs, but you didn't stick with that. 
What was it about those you didn't like? Well, my, my first, gosh, 10 plus years uh, operating locally in make, and I was a transaction engineer. I did generic marketing. I, I went through phases as I got started, like a lot of investors will do, shiny object thing. Uh, I want to try this. Okay. Hey, wait, there's something that looks better. I tried <laughs> sandwich lease options and a bunch of other stuff. And just found things about it I didn't like. But over time, what, what I started doing was I would do a lot of generic marketing, whether that was bandit signs. I did billboards at one time, direct mail to different types of motivated sellers, uh, magnetics on my car. When the leads would come in, I would sort them out. Is this going to be a house I sell with seller financing? Is this going to be a rehab and retail uh, maybe this is one to buy and fix up and Section 8 rental. I did all of those things. But then what happened uh, in, in 2010, I had a major life change. I got a divorce. I left the country. And it's hard to do rehabs from, you know, thousands of miles away. So what I really did was just really narrow things down to what I really liked. And that was buying subject to selling on seller financing. Uh, I became interested initially in subject two because what I wanted to create a lifestyle from cash flow, and I didn't have a ton of money. And by that point, after the first year in, I didn't have a job, so it was hard to get bank financing. And I said, "Well, how can I create this lifestyle with cash flow if I if the bank won't lend me any money to buy houses? How can I buy as many houses as I want? Taking over other people's payments was the solution." So that's really what got me interested initially in subject to, and of course that just carried on to what we do today. So that's what made you focus on sub two. That was a question I was going to ask people. Now, for of all the creative finance types though, that was the one that spoke to you. Why more so than some of the other types? Well, like I said, I went through a period where I did sandwich lease options, bought a course on it, said, hey, this sounds like a good idea. Again, I can accumulate as many houses as I want. And I know investors who do great with sandwich lease options. They lease a house with an option to purchase at one price from a seller. Then they sell it on a lease option to an end buyer. They collect option consideration. They collect cash flow. They collect back in. I did a few of those deals. Uh, one of them actually went by the numbers uh, to the end. Uh, one of them, we actually had to retail after we went through two or three buyers that didn't come through. Uh, but what I found with those, anytime you're in the middle, you have the potential for sellers to go around you to buyers and just other types of situations. It just wasn't ideal for me. For that reason, I didn't like it. Plus, I couldn't sell those houses with seller financing. I only had a lease and option. And what I've learned over the years is I can collect more up front if I seller finance. And instead of 25% actually exercising their option and, and buying the house down the road with seller financing, 80, 90% actually refinance me a few years down the road. So the actual turn rate is much better for me with seller. Okay. Buying. So that's what I thought. So you actually own the house on a sub two where right. you don't, where you don't own, own the house. You control the property on exactly. if you've got a lease and an option. Right. And that okay. may work for some people, but I, I like to control things. My wife. Yeah. Me. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're alike it. We're alike in that. We want, right. we want the control. Right. For some people, this may seem, well, unreasonable we'll say that that may seem unreasonable so you have someone that has a property for sale and they're thinking i'm going to get the cash out of this property that's mm -hmm. their thought process right. i'm going to get cash out of it then william comes along and he says well maybe i'll give you some cash but maybe not and i'll i want to buy your property subject to the existing mortgage which for an unscrupulous person can leave the seller in a precarious position oh, yeah. if you yeah. are if you are not a morally good person, ethical person. So explain, first of all, I want to you to explain to people uh, exactly how you do a subject to deal. Let's start there. Exactly. If you're walking up to a seller, how does that deal proceed? Well, we, we start out by looking for someone who obviously wants to sell their house or has a situation. They may not have decided to sell yet, but maybe they're 
in foreclosure, maybe they're getting a divorce, maybe they have to move in, in a short period of time. Uh, for example, let's just take VA loans as an example. If you target VA loans, what you'll see with these a lot of times is uh, someone gets transferred into a new town, uh, they, they're in the military, they buy a house with their VA entitlement, and with a VA entitlement, lets them finance 100%, so it's not uncommon uh, if you use some type of software like PropStream or uh, something like that, where you can research these things, you'll find uh, Joe bought a house last year, uh, sales price, he bought it for $250, he financed $260 because yeah. they'll let them roll closing costs and everything in. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens to Joe in 18 months when he's transferred across the country, okay, he still owes $255 in a, a normal market or even a slightly appreciating market, what is the house worth? 260, 270? Let's say it's worth 265, he owes 255. If he hired a realtor to sell this house for him, it's gonna cost him $20,000, okay. okay? Joe's only got 5,000 in equity and probably doesn't have 15,000 in his pocket to pay that realtor. So he either can't afford to sell it that way. A lot of times they'll turn into what I call accidental rentals if they don't get them sold. If we approach these people and say, hey, Joe, we can buy this house from you right now, cost you nothing out of pocket, uh, and you can move on down the road. He's got to be at his new location in 30 days. So they like that situation. And this is the way we put it. We don't even talk about subject two because Nobody knows what that means. A lot of yeah. investors don't know what it means. We no, say, they don't understand. Yeah. We say, Joe, what if we could make the payments for you until we can get a buyer? Is that something that might work for you? Mm -hmm. And they'll, I mean, you'll hear anything from, well, yeah, how does that work? Or would you do that? Or, you know, how can, how can we do it? So that's a good example of how it works. It's, it's just finding somebody in a situation that needs to sell and then presenting them with a solution to their problem. I had that exact situation with a couple that was getting a divorce and it was exactly what you said. It was a hundred percent VA loan. Right. They had rolled in their closing costs. And at the time I bought the property, it was maybe worth what the ARV was, you know, the loan and the ARV were the same. Right. I, my only thought about buying subject two is you have to be sure that you're not in a fringe area, one that could possibly not go up if on the rare occasion where you might really need to sell that property, then you don't want to be the one taking the loss. So how do you, what, what are your rules around, or, or do you have guidelines around that or how does that work for you? We, we do. We, we have a pretty specific profile for the properties we're looking for. We're looking for something fairly new. Now, do we hold to this hundred percent? Well, no. I mean, you're going to find things yeah. outside of the box. But typically we like a house that's that's relatively new, 10, maybe 15 years old, something relatively new in a newer subdivision that's in really good shape, that's in good school districts. And we're only looking at properties in specific towns and locations. We're very specific in what we're looking for as far as uh, population, job availability, schools, income ratios to median home prices. And that's how we make, you know, pretty sure that, that we're making a good investment that way. We also always fall back on rent rates because it's rare for rental rates to go down. That's, that's, I mean, it really is. Even in a bad economy, uh, good economy, bad rent rates stay pretty steady or increase. So rent, renting the house is always our plan B. Let's say that uh, we're right, right now we're in a super hot market ac across the country. There are pockets that aren't, but for the most part, we're seeing 17% appreciation uh, in, in, in every market that we're in. So, but what happens if that $250,000 house next year is only worth 200 and we can't sell it, morally, we can't sell it for what we owe on it to a new buyer. What do we do then? Well, renting is our plan B. So as long as we can still make a good cash flow on that property, then we'll just fall back on our rental if the worst were to happen. So it is the same criteria as for any deal. You like, if you remember back in 2008, that became the new criteria. If you were a rehabber, it might be a great rehab, a, a great deal for a retail buyer, but not all of those properties back then would cash flow. Right. And that became the new criteria. So mm -hmm. the property had to cash flow if you weren't able to sell it. 
Right. And I think if you do that with every investment, you're a lot safer than if you count on just one strategy. You better have more than one exit strategy. You bet. I, I know an investor right now is very successful. Uh, and he and I had a conversation recently. And, and his thing is he looks for free and clear properties that are owned by people that are retiring or have bought their retirement home or whatever the case may be. And let's just say the house is worth 300 and it's free and clear. He'll contact them and say, listen, what if I could pay you 350 for your house? which is intriguing to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they get investor calls, it's usually for two thirds of value. So it engages them in conversation. And all he does is get them to sell our finance and structure the note where the payments allow him cash flow, And he uses those as rentals and makes a tremendous amount of money. Wow. I mean, it, it's an incredible, I mean, it, it, what does it matter what he pays for the house if the cash flow paying down his debt allows him to make money every month doesn't matter what he pays for that what now what would the terms be on something like that um the seller probably would not go for 20 30 years he would be he would want something less than that so what would the terms look like on a deal like well that? the way he he spoke to me he tries to of course tries to get it for as long a term as he can but if it's only five or ten years then it becomes key how you're structuring that payment Will all of it go to principal? Will just, you know, a significant part of it go to principal? Because you can write that note any way that the seller's agreeable to. You know, most sellers get stuck on what they're getting for their house, not the terms of the note. Not so, necessarily interest uh, either. Right. Sometimes, sometimes of, you don't have to pay interest. A lot of these are, are zero interest loans. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I'd never thought about that because that was my question to him. So <laughs> I understand no equity and even slightly underwater. You know, if you're mm -hmm. taking over sub two for 255 and it's worth 250, yeah, that's doable. But he, he offers significantly more, 20 percent more than they're asking. Wow. And, and does that does it that way. So that's pretty cool. Well, that guy, that's cool. If it works out, it makes me nervous. Well, I asked him that. I said, what do you do? I said, what do you do if the market tanks tomorrow and that house that's worth 300 today that you agreed to pay 350 for is only worth 200? He said, well, you've got a couple of options. He said, we've structured the note where we're going to make money on cash flow regardless. So we can just continue to do that. Or we can call the seller up and say, hey, I guess you've seen the news. <laughs> we need to talk, you know, and they can either restructure it for him or not. And he can let them have it back. It's seller financing. It's not like, you know, he's going to get foreclosed on by Bank of America. Mm -hmm. So that's what he said he does. <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting concept. That's not for the faint of heart, though. Really? I, I, for sure. New investors don't, don't try this at home. But, uh, <laughs> this guy's been doing it for a really long time. Okay, I want to talk about something that you have called your 12 houses blueprint. And this uh, is your, is it a course or is it, is it a process? What do you, what do you call it? It's not, it's not a course, not yet. Uh, it's something that we've got on the drawing board for later this year, but it's something that we teach our coaching students in our sub two max group. Uh, and what happened was when I, uh, in 2010, when I moved out of the country and, and took a break for a while and said, I can't be a transaction engineer anymore. What do I want to do? Like I said, I, I distill things down to my favorite parts of real estate, buying subject to selling with seller financing, and then it's just taken care of. Their chances of them buying are, are pretty good down the road. They're going to refinance and take me out. And so that's what we started doing. And really, it's, it's just really a really simple program. It's something anybody can do. It solves a lot of problems. A lot of new people get started and they're overwhelmed by these people talking about buying 25 houses a month and how you got to you know, have 10 VAs and you got all these people cold calling and all these people doing all this work for you. So you're buying all these houses and generating all these leads. And I said, well, what if you could buy one house a month and create an income of over a quarter of a million dollars a year in year one and over half a million dollars a year by year three and, and maintain that all by buying just one house a month. Now, if there's anybody out there that can't live on half a million dollars a year, 
I don't know what to tell you. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you, if you, maybe if you want to drive a Lambo and have a private jet and all that stuff, this isn't for you. But for the average person, uh, half a million dollars a year is pretty good lifestyle. So, uh, and I really just broke it down and put it together in, uh, and like I said, it's not a course yet, but that's what we teach. You're looking for nice homes and nice neighborhoods that uh, are 10 years old or so. Uh, motivated sellers that need to sell, we buy at an average of 94% LTV. So uh, we're buying pretty high LTVs. And, uh, and you can make uh, forty dollars to $50,000 over a three-year period for each one of these houses. Uh, it's just really a pretty simple program. It's If you have a full-time job you can still market enough to buy one house a month and uh, that's how it works so so break it down if they're if you're buying uh one house so the the net cash flow would need to be what on on each property we, what's, we what's, your, what's your for, number we look for a uh, cash flow of around four hundred dollars a door per month and uh, let me tell you I, I had this thing pulled up here let me see if I about, 400. about four hundred about four hundred dollars a month um I'll pull it up and go over with you here. And, and I've got an example here uh, for you. Okay. Let's just say that you're buying a house worth $250 uh, for the loan balance of $240. Now that's a zero equity deal. Okay. Uh, if someone had that house and needed to sell it, they'd have to come out of pocket ten, fifteen thousand dollars to sell it. It's at three and a half percent interest. It's one year into a 30 year note. Let's say that VA loan that we talked about earlier is a really okay. good example. Now their principal and interest payment is 1077 a month. Uh, their taxes, uh, their taxes and insurance are 300 a month. So the total PITI on that deal is 1377 a month. Now, the average rental rate for that house is $1,600 a month in that market. That's a three bedroom, two bath. We don't ever buy less than that. Uh, we sell that house for $269. We market up about 7%. Uh, I found that that's a fair amount uh, in a market. If I call four appraisers on a $250,000 house and we've got a contract at $269, someone will come in at that. That's, mm -hmm. that's a fair margin. Uh, so we sell it for two sixty nine. We get twenty five thousand dollars down. We look for somewhere between eight and ten percent down on our houses. So that gives us gives us a, a loan balance of two forty four to our buyer. We finance that at seven percent for forty years. We've been amortizing loans for buyers at forty years for the last ten years now. And I get questions on that sometimes by people saying, "Is that legal? Can you do a forty year?" mortgage. And there's nothing in Dodd-Frank or any state uh, SAFE Act laws, anything that prohibits you from amortizing a loan for 40 years or longer. In fact, uh, since COVID, a lot the government has encouraged lenders to stretch out some of these loans that have been in forbearance now to 40-year notes to help the homeowner be able to repay all of the arrears. And we mm -hmm. actually had a conversation in a mastermind group that I made a couple of days ago about 40 year mortgages becoming the norm in the mortgage industry. Uh, I don't know if you remember this or not, Sharon, uh, but when I was a kid, the maximum length of time you could finance a car for was 24 months. Yeah, that was probably, it. yeah, two years. Now, uh -huh. Now, in the space of, of my lifetime, you can finance a new car for 120 months. It's just as things go up, people spread out that debt, you can expect mortgage loans to become 40-year norm, especially with the market that we've been in. But anyway, so our principal and interest payment when we finance the 244 to our buyer is 1516 a month. You add on the taxes and insurance, their payment is 1816 a month. We try not to get too high over market rent. In this case, we're going over about 200 bucks, what market rent would be. Uh, that's going to give you a cash flow of 439 a month off of this one property. So in 36 months, you owe 226 on your loan. Your buyer owes you 240. So that's going to give you a back end payoff of a little over $14,000 on this zero equity loan. So what do you make on this property over 36 months? Well, you get your $25,000 down payment. 
You get four thirty nine dollars a month for 36 months. That's almost $16,000. And then you get another $14,000 on the back end. So what do you make on a no equity deal like this? Uh, a little over $55,000 in 36 months. We always try to set our buyers up to refinance us in about 36 months. Because okay. you can come in with a 400 credit score and have it good enough to get an FHA loan or whatever it is that they need in that time. In a couple of years. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense because when you talked about uh, stretching out the the loan to 40 years, I'm thinking, well, that means their payment's going to go down, which means you're getting less money. I was trying to do that math in my head, but yeah, that makes sense. It goes down. Their payment's going to go down a little mm -hmm. bit, but it adds to your back end because their principal pay down is going to go down too. Mm -hmm. And you're, remember, your financing on that house was at three and a half, and that note that you wrote them was at seven. So your principal pay down is a lot faster uh, than theirs. When you started out, uh, you owed 240 and they owed 244, but you've accumulated another $10,000 in back end profit over 36 months. Pretty cool. Yeah. So if you did this for a few years, then that's where you start to see the big paydays uh, a year, not just. Well, uh, well, if you start today, Sharon, and you buy one house a month, by the time you get to March of 2020, you know, one in 12 months, uh, your, your profit for that 12 month period is going to be $334,200. You're going to do 12 houses at $25,000 down a piece. That's $300,000. You're going to make $34,200 in cash flow. Okay. That's, you know, another, gosh, $34,000. So you're over $334,000 in profit the first year. No back end cash outs because your buyers are still in there paying. Mm -hmm. But the way this thing breaks down, by the end of year two, you're making almost four hundred thousand dollars a year, and the end of year three, you're at four sixty. Now, the beginning of year four is when your buyers start cashing you out, and that's when you're looking at, in in this case scenario, with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, uh, six hundred sixty one thousand dollar profit each year between your cash flow, your down payments, and your back end. Now, that does assume that you don't have any cost. It's not taking out if you had cost associated with selling or anything else, but still the numbers are pretty impressive. A lot of houses that we've bought, we didn't give the seller anything. They were move in ready. The people just moved into the house, especially with these newer homes, VA loans, you know that those houses have been, they're in good condition. Their appraisal process is much more stringent. They have to be up to date and those sorts of things. So. A lot of times they're, they're a good target. Let me ask you this. If they're coming in to you uh, with less than great credit, how do they have 25000 down? You'd be surprised at the number of people who have either less than great credit. And it, a lot of times it's not even credit. Uh, a lot of uh, Hispanic borrowers, you know, undocumented people, they need a they house have. to live in too. And they uh, have cash. They do. Self-employed mm -hmm. people. Uh, that, you know, you cook the book. I mean, I don't know what else to say it, but <laughs> you, you, you're trying not to pay taxes so you don't show all of your income. Listen, that's on them. That's, that's, a, that's between them and the IRS. All I know is there's, maybe they own their own businesses, whatever the case may be. They're only showing $40,000 a year in income, but they make 100. Listen, uh, they're going to have to fix some things to get refinanced. Now, we don't put balloons in these notes. Uh, we just don't do it. Uh, that gets into Dodd-Frank and some other things, but we do a lot of things to encourage them to refinance, okay, over okay. the years. Uh, every buyer goes through a licensed mortgage professional, uh, and they stay in contact with them saying, you know, things like, hey, did you guys realize if you refinance today, you're going to save $419 a month on your mortgage payment? That's a new van payment. Okay, yeah. for your family, <laughs> new, things like that. Van. And because people can't wait to run out and spend any excess money they've got. I mean, just in general, that's how most people operate. So, well, everybody buys on payments. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't look at the total cost. They don't look at the interest they're paying over years. They only look at the payments. So that that makes sense. And one of my questions was about Dodd Frank. And you answer that. So you use a mortgage uh, loan originator on all your deals so that you bypass Dodd-Frank. 
Well, I'll tell you this. I'm not so worried about Dodd-Frank. For me, it was about convenience. I started doing a lot of this stuff before buying remotely. It was really cool. I did it out of necessity. I lived thousands of miles away. I lived out of the country. So I needed people there to process my buyers, to take pictures of the house. Real estate agents, they can help you do a lot of things. Uh, those mortgage professionals, the same thing, credit repair, uh, you know, utilize licensed local people. It adds a lot of credibility to your business because you're dealing with people, if you're, especially if you're a remote investor that have never met you, you know, to a lot of people that's important. I haven't met you that I'm handing over $20,000 to you or 25,000. We always do a closing with an attorney's office. Uh, you know, we, their licenses give us credibility and they're dealing with local people that they know. Exactly. Well, folks, this gives you a way, if you don't have a lot of money to put into a deal, William has explained this in a way that should be crystal clear, but he does do coaching. Um, he's an expert coach. He's an expert on this topic. So, uh, I'll let him tell you in a minute how to get in touch with him, but do you have some final advice for folks uh, if they want to dive into sub two? Well, sub two is, is not super complicated, but there are some aspects of it. I think that you need to take into consideration. You know, I see people throw newbies in it all the time and say, just go out there, uh, get the deal, do this, do that. You, you know, hold the property as a rental rentals should be the last thing you're doing unless you've got some money in the bank. Understand that you're making a promise to these people who are probably under some kind of pressure, whether it's a divorce, whether it's a transfer, you know, they're trusting you to make the payments on the house. So that is a big moral obligation that you have. So make sure you're in a financial position to be able to do that, either have money or access to it to make payments if you need to, unless you have a strong buyer's list or people you can, uh, you can uh, sell the property to right away, things like that. So that's the biggest advice I could give in that nature with regard to sub two. With regard to just real estate investing in general, learn something and then do something with what you learn. We talked in the beginning of this about Carlton Sheets, and I'm going to tell you, it sounds funny, but I bet I have bought at least half a dozen foreclosure properties and found copies of Carlton Sheets courses in there still in the wrapper. Oh my word, okay. are you kidding? The, 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 I mean, their solution to their problem is in their closet. They bought it, mm -hmm. but they never even opened it. It's amazing how many times I've seen that happen. I mean, I really couldn't believe it, but oh my gosh, it's out there. That's amazing. So how can folks reach out to you, William? Uh, the best way to reach me, I'm like everybody else. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can find me, just William Tingle uh, on Facebook. You can contact me through our website, sub2deals.com. That's S-U-B, the number two deals.com. Um, that, those are the best ways to get in touch with me. And I'll be sure and put all the links here so that you all can find him. Trust me, he's not that hard to find. Oh, no, no, I'm easy. <laughs> Well, William, thanks so much for coming on the show today. And as always, you, you're just a wealth of knowledge and you, you provide so much value for folks. And thanks also to the listeners for coming out week after week. I really appreciate the fact that you all show up. And if you would leave us a rating and a review on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it. So thanks again, William. Have a great rest of your week. And I will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now. 